Good morning, church. How you do? Stand on up with me, please. Stand up with me so we can praise the Lord. Psalm 150 says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him trumpet sound. Praise him harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and with some dancing. I love it when the president's out. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise him with the stringed instruments and the pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen, church? Let's have a little fun. Let's have a little fun, Terrence. that has breath this morning. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. us breath 
you have given us life. And Father, you have given us life abundantly. Father, life is good because you make us rich. It's not about things. It's not about the finest cars, the finest houses, the finest clothes. But Father, you tell us in your word that because we know you, we are richer than we'll ever be. Because Father, we find our life in you. Father, forgive us for finding our lives and things. Forgive us, Lord, for creating gods before you, idols that come before you. You, Father, are our sole deliverer, our sole priority. In the name of King Jesus, hallelujah, to whom we surrender, amen. Job 11, verse 13 says, if you would direct your heart right and spread out your hand to him. If iniquity is in your hand, put it far away and do not let wickedness dwell in your tents. Then indeed, you could lift up your faith, lift up your face without moral defect, and you would be steadfast and not fear. For you would forget your trouble as waters that have passed by, you would remember it. Your life would be brighter than noonday. Darkness would be like the morning. Then you would trust because there is hope. And you would look around and rest securely. You would lie down and none would disturb you. And many would entreat your favor. We lift our hands to the one who, to whom we surrender this morning, and we sing unto him. His name is Jesus. Let's bow our spirits and bow our heads. All to Jesus I surrender all. To him I freely give. I will live love and trust him in his presence daily. Live. All to Jesus I surrender. Yes. 
Bow with me in prayer. God, to you belongs the offering of our praise and the sacrifice of our lives. And I pray that our commitment this morning before you is that we hold nothing back. We surrender all to you. We're grateful as the busyness of the semester approaches and perhaps overwhelms us. We're grateful that the busyness of our lives is outpaced by the greatness of your grace, the sufficiency of your hand. So God, I pray for the students who are here. I pray your blessings upon them as they finish well this semester. Pray your blessings on this service for the one who will bring the message that he may speak your truth to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It is my great delight to welcome all of you to chapel this morning. We have some special guests who are here with us from First Baptist Church Mansfield. And if you'll just kind of wave your hands and we want to say a word of welcome to you. Thank you for coming. Dr. Walker is the interim pastor at First Baptist Church Mansfield, and so they've come to support him and make sure he's not preaching a sermon that he preached last Sunday. So uh, thank you for coming. We are delighted that you are here. You have perhaps noticed some vacancies this morning, some empty chairs that are around you, I'm told. We have about 25 of our faculty who are gone for the Evangelical Theological Society, which means that I was 26th in line for this particular responsibility this morning. <laughs> My primary qualification is that I wasn't anywhere else. And so uh, I, it is my privilege to welcome you. And I want to begin by uh, giving you the schedule for the rest of the service. In just a few moments, Matthew Wilbanks, who is a third year in our college, will be leading us in the reading of scripture. And we are continuing through the book of First Samuel. He will be reading First Samuel 18, verses 20 through 30. And then we will be led again by our uh, by Dr. Day and our praise band and choir. And then after that, it is my privilege to introduce to you Dr. Kyle Walker. Now, Dr. Walker really needs no introduction. You already know Dr. Walker. Dr. Walker is a product of Southwestern Seminary after he graduated from the University of Alabama in 2007 with a BS in organizational leadership. He came to Southwestern Seminary where he completed his MDiv in 2010 his Ph.D. in Preaching and Systematic Theology in 2015. Dr. Walker currently serves as the Dean of Students here at Southwestern Seminary previously from 2010 to 2014, was the Director of Admissions. And uh, so we're uh, prayerfully looking forward to the word that God has through him. Now, I have to confess, uh, I'm, I'm somewhat new to the process of introducing chapel speakers. So I began to think when I knew this particular responsibility was coming, what is it that I do as the introducer of the chapel speaker? So I began to reflect on others before me who had filled this role. And so I studied some of those great introducers uh, here in chapel. I studied Dr. McCarty, who was a game show host in introducing Dr. Patterson and compared the president to Pepe Le Pew. <laughs> Later, Dr. McCarty, uh, 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 referred to decisions from the president's office as manure and compost. Dr. Owens, when he assumed the introducing responsibilities, showed pictures of, on the screen of people who were named Paige Patterson, most of whom were female. <laughs> Later, Dr. Owens assumed the role of baseball catcher in introducing Dr. Johnson, and he informed us that Dr. Patterson was around at the invention of baseball in 1839. I studied Dr. Allen, who when he was introducing the president had a copy of his own commentary of Hebrews in one hand and a copy of Dr. Patterson's commentary on Revelation in the other and was noting the size despairing or the dis discrepancy between those two and implied that he, the student, had outpaced Dr. Patterson, the teacher in intellect and wisdom, and that the president was not as intelligent as some of his faculty. 
On another occasion, Dr. Allen, in referencing the text in John 8, that he who is without sin should cast the first stone, Dr. Allen suggested that Dr. Patterson would be the least qualified to pick up a stone. Dr. Blazing accused the president of being mischievous and archaic. And then even Dr. Patterson himself, in regularly introducing others, uh, professes himself to be 118 years old. Now, I have been on faculty 10 years, and Dr. Patterson has been 118 the entire time. <laughs> and even though it's been a long time since high school math, uh, just counting on my fingers would suggest he ought to at least be 128 by now. But now, uh, it, what I have learned is evident to me about my responsibility as the introducer. It is my responsibility to make some comparison between the chapel speaker and the president. So I come to Dr. Walker. Dr. Walker is young. <laughs> he is tall. <laughs> he is good looking. <laughs> he is universally liked <laughs> and has exemplary character. <laughs> and I confess that I find nothing with which to compare to our president. So I break with tradition, and so it is a delight for me to introduce Dr. Kyle Walker. And I do want to take a minute to introduce his wife, Lauren, who is here. Lauren and Kyle have been married for seven years. Seven years? That's right. Actually, eight. Eight years? Okay, I want you to get that right. Uh, they currently have two children. They have two girls, Taylor Grace and Libby, but in just a few weeks. In fact, mere days from now, uh, Lauren is due with their third child, a baby boy, and so we will be praying for them. And Dr. Walker, uh, we're praying for you as you come and deliver God's message to us. And so here's where we will be for the rest of uh, this service. Matthew, you come and read scripture, and then Dr. Day will lead us again, and then Kyle will listen to you with open hearts and minds. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word? First Samuel 18, 20 through 30. Now Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. When they told Saul, the thing was agreeable to him. Saul thought I would give him that he may become a snare to him, and that, he, that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David, For a second time, you may be my son-in-law today. Then Saul commanded his servants, Speak to David secretly, saying, Behold, the king delights in you, and all his servants love you. Now therefore, become the king's son-in-law. So Saul David spoke the word, so Saul's servant spoke the words to David. But David said, It is trivial in your sight to become the king's son-in-law, since I am a poor man and lightly esteemed. The servants of Saul reported to, reported to him according to the words of which David spoke. Then Saul said, Thus you shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry except a hundred foreskins from the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. Now Saul planned to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. When his servants told David these words, it pleased David to become the king's son-in-law. Before the days had expired, David rose up and went to his men and struck down 200 among the Philistines. Then David brought their foreskins and gave them in full number to the king, that he may become the king's son-in-law. So Saul gave him Michael and his daughter for a wife. When Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him, then Saul was even more afraid of David. Thus Saul was David's enemy continually. Then the commanders of the Philistines went out to, to battle, and, at, and it happened as often as they went out that David behaved himself more wisely than the servants of Saul, so his name was highly esteemed. This is the word of the Lord.
voices of discontent are all I That's grounded in faith. Beyond this shifting sand, on a rock that remains the same. Oh, I believe in hope, believe in faith, believe in a God who will guide me. Oh, I cannot see. Amen and good morning, students. As long as Dr. Patterson doesn't go back and listen to that introduction, I'll probably still have a job when he gets back. <clears throat> well, students, I, I know if you're honest with me, you'd probably say, Kyle, we get tired of your emails to our student account. But I do want to tell you just what, an, what a privilege it is to serve you as dean of students and that it is my highest honor to have the opportunity to stand before you and preach God's word. This morning, I consider to be a little bit different because I'm approaching this morning as part two of a previous message you heard earlier this semester in chapel. That message was brought to you by Dr. McCarty from Ruth chapter one. Now, how many of you were here with Ruth chapter one? Yeah, good many of you. If you remember, Dr. McCarty called that chapter of Ruth the hardest chapter of Ruth to preach. 
because it takes you to the rock bottom of the story, to the very bottom of the barrel of the story of Ruth. And quite honestly, Dr. McCarty just had to look at us and say, hey, I've got nothing for you. And yet, of course, even there, even in that part of the story of the scripture, Dr. McCarty was able to bring out great truths for us from God's word there. And yet, students, as I prayed and prepared for it today, I just, couldn't, I just couldn't imagine you finishing your fall semester hanging at the bottom of the book of Ruth, where everything goes wrong. I thought, man, there's no way they're going to pass their finals if we leave them there. So my intent this morning is to redeem your misery, if you will, through part two of the book of Ruth, revealing the rest of the story from Ruth chapter four, if you have your Bible and will join me there in Ruth chapter chapter four. Now, before we dive in to chapter four, in order to dive in, we really need to get a running start to dive in, a running start. So if you remember Ruth, right, it's the time of the judges. What that means is, in short, that the people of God have exited Egypt. They have entered the promised land. Moses and Joshua are dead. And a generation grew up who did not know the Lord, the text says. They did not know the Lord. There's no king in Israel. People are doing what's right in their own eyes. It's a time of chaos and confusion, you might say, to make matters worse. When the book of Ruth opens, there's a famine. People are starving, they're hungry, and we're introduced to a man by the name of Elimelech. Elimelech, by the way, is a name that means my God is king. Hold on to that. We'll return to that later. Elimelech has a wife named Naomi. They have two sons, and Elimelech's idea is to get out of Israel to go to a nearby country called Moab in order to escape the famine. So he takes his His two sons and wife, they go to Moab. They're there for 10 years, the text says. While there, his two sons marry Moabite women. And yet, one of them is barren. They experience barrenness there. And by the end of 10 years, Elimelech and his sons are dead. Naomi now is left all alone. She's empty and she's bitter, she says. So now, though she does hear that the famine is ending in Bethlehem, in Israel, she hears there's food there. She she wants to return. She's empty and bitter now. She tells her two daughters-in-law to stay behind. One does, but one named Ruth, if you remember. One named Ruth clings to her, walks away from her family, from her land, from her Moabite gods, clings to Naomi, commits herself to serving Yahweh fully converts to following the one true God, says, where you will go, I will go. Your God will be my God and your people will be my people. And she follows Ruth back to Bethlehem. When they return there, Ruth finds herself from daylight to dark in the fields gathering the scraps of barley to try to eke out a pitiful existence with her mother-in-law, just trying to stay alive. And yet all of a sudden, things start to turn around. Next thing you know, she happens to find herself in a field owned by the man named Boaz. Boaz is a worthy man in Israel. In other words, he's a man of upstanding character and substantial means. Ruth finds favor in his eyes. And Naomi's in the background seeing what's happening. And she concocts a plan because she's searching to find Ruth a home and rest So she concocts a plan for Ruth to propose to Boaz, as you know. Ruth follows Naomi's plan to a T. Boaz accepts Ruth's proposal. Things are finally starting to turn around. Things are on the upswing. All of a sudden, it looks like Naomi and Ruth's future might all of a sudden improve. And yet there's one problem. There's another man. There's a closer kinsman redeemer, if you will. We're going to explain what that means. There's one closer that has the right to redeem and marry Ruth first before Boaz does. All of a sudden, from the rock bottom of the story, here we are on the upswing, and all of a sudden, there's one man in the way, one one problem preventing all of this from coming to a great and grand conclusion. Are you kidding me? What in the world is going to happen? Look at the end of chapter 3. Look at... Verse 18 here. This is Naomi speaking to her daughter-in-law, 
Ruth. She says, she replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out for the man, that's Boaz, will not rest, but will settle the matter today. So you see, Boaz had told Ruth, after she proposed, he said, look, there's a closer redeemer, there's another man, I'm going to see if he will redeem, but if he won't, as the Lord lives, I will. So Boaz, what's your plan? What are you going to do? How are you going to work this out? What's going to happen? And will this work out where Boaz can claim this woman that he loves? Look at chapter 4, beginning in verses 1 and 2. Now, Boaz had gone up to the gate, and he sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, and sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. And so they sat down. Will Ruth find rest? Will she find a home? She's forsaken everything she's known that's familiar to her. To follow the one true God, to commit herself to serving the Lord, to serving Yahweh, how will he respond to her? Will he give her a home and refuge and a rest? If so, she's going to have to have a man. Is Boaz that man? If you notice in chapter 4, verse 1, Boaz is not going to the gate. He has gone to the gate. This right here, students, is a man on a mission, pursuing Ruth here. He's a man on a mission. How many of you have been on that mission of pursuing your bride-to-be, and you went about it the right way by asking her father if you could have his permission and blessing to marry her? Have you gone through that? Maybe you're hoping to go through that. I see some hands. So what, what happens in that moment is not unlike what's happening here. Of course, Ruth doesn't have a father here to ask, but there is a right way for Boaz to pursue Ruth. And that's exactly what he is doing. Now, going to the gates sounds odd. Going to the gates of the city to do business sounds odd unless you realize that the gates, the gates are the place in Bethlehem in this day and time where business goes down. The gates are the center of the civic and social life of the city. So for Bethlehem, it's not the county courthouse. For Bethlehem, it's not the Friday night football game. It's all about what happens at the gates. That's where rush hour is. That's where business goes down. So that's where Boaz goes here. He sits down by saying, I'm ready to do business. And what do you know? The text says, behold, the Redeemer. That's the closer Redeemer comes by just like that. A coincidence? Or you think God's up to something? Boaz looks at him and says, hey, so-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, hey, you, I've got business with you. Sit down with me here. By the way, take note of the fact that the biblical narrator leaves the closest kinsman, kinsman redeemer anonymous. He doesn't name him. Of course, Boaz knew the man's name, but he doesn't draw it out. He doesn't mention it here and perhaps for a very real reason. Now, remember what a redeemer is in Israel. A redeemer is the closest male relative that would have the right and responsibility of buying back property in a family that could be lost for some reason. Also, kinsmen redeemers could buy back someone who has been sold into slavery, but here, perhaps, the focus is on buying back property that could be lost. That's what a redeemer is. You can see more about that in Leviticus chapter 25. So Boaz sees this redeemer, this closest one who has this right and responsibility. First, come by, calls him, but he needs 10 more men, 10 witnesses to make whatever business they're about to do official. He secures them. Now watch verse three and four. Then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there's no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Now, wait a second, Boaz. I thought you wanted to marry this woman. I thought you were pursuing her in order to secure her as your wife, that you loved her, that you wanted to marry her. Why are you bringing up land first in this conversation? Where are you going with this? What's the deal? Well, two things that work here. Number one, Boaz is pursuing Ruth strategically. He's got a plan. 
that we're going to see unfold. But number two, Boaz is pursuing Ruth rightly. There's more at stake than just Ruth and Boaz here. There's more things involved, and Boaz is going about it the right way as a worthy man pursuing this woman. What's the deal with land? Well, Elimelech had some. Elimelech had some, but now Elimelech's dead, as you know. His two sons are dead. Now Naomi has this land. It's in her name, but it's not doing her any good. Think about it. She's an old widow. She can't drive a tractor anymore. She's not bailing any barley. She's got this field, but this field, think about it, it's not bringing food to her mouth. It's doing her no good. She needs a redeemer, a kinsman redeemer, someone to come along and buy back this property, to keep it in the family, to work it and keep it, to provide for her is what she needs. And Boaz knows this. He brings this up to the closest redeemer, says, you redeem it. If you want, then I will. Boaz just strategically delays his heartfelt motivation for being that redeemer. Now think about this. Boaz at first presents this as a financial opportunity for this closest kinsman redeemer that you'd be crazy to pass up. Yes, buy the field. Yes, that's going to be an expense. But the expense of that field is going to be more than offset by the produce of it that will pay to support Naomi and care for her. The proceeds are going to be a great benefit to him. And not only that, but Naomi... Yes, he'll have to care for her, but she has no heir for the field to return to. She's beyond childbearing years to even have one. So that's important, students, because in Israel, not only was this practice of property redemption practice, but it was tied to another practice known as leveret marriage. Leveret marriage, you see, was when a husband died and left a widow, that dead husband's brother would marry that widow in order to produce an heir to carry on his name and to be an heir for him and also to provide for that childless widow. But that doesn't seem to be a possibility here. That doesn't seem to be involved with the deal. Naomi's beyond childbearing years. She has no heir. So Boaz is serving this opportunity up as a grand financial gain. What do you think the Redeemer's gonna say? Where do I sign? Where's the dotted line? Boaz, what are you doing? Are you giving Ruth away? Watch verse five and six. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite the widow of, perhaps as he said it, the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself for I cannot redeem it. Now that's what I'm talking about, Boaz. Pulls out his trump card. He had an ace that he just hasn't used yet, but strategically delays to play here. He That is, the closest redeemer responded before he knew the whole story. Have you ever been in that situation where all of a sudden you find yourself in an incredibly embarrassing situation? You know what I'm talking about? All of a sudden things are fine one moment, then all of a sudden the next moment you feel your face flushing, your ears are getting hot, You start sweating and wondering, where's the closest hole that I can jump in to get out of this situation? That's exactly what Boaz does here with this kinsman redeemer. Sets him up and then turns it with a strategic delay to put him in an extremely awkward position in front of all these witnesses and those those elders here at the gate. And by doing so, puts this man in a cold sweat. Now, we don't know exactly why. This kinsman did not realize marrying Ruth was part of the deal. But here's a good guess. She is a Moabite. Do you remember where they came from? They came from Lot's incestuous relationship with his two daughters. Genesis chapter 19. When they became a people group, their king Balak, remember, in the Old Testament, was the one who hired Balaam to curse the Israelites in the wilderness. You remember the Moabite women who seduced the Israelites to sin? You remember what God did to the Israelites as a result? He struck dead 24,000 of them. Deuteronomy says no Moabite can enter the assembly of Yahweh to the 10th generation. Listen, if you were a teenage boy in Israel 
the one thing you dare not do is bring home a Moabite to mama. That was not gonna go well. This is no longer the financial deal that the Redeemer thought it would be. Now to him, the risk outweighed the reward. So Boaz delivers his knockout punch to redeem the right to pursue and win his woman that he's after. Now don't fail to notice this. Yes, there was nothing good about a Moabite to an Israelite. But Ruth had walked away from everything Moabite about her. She'd walked away from her family, from her land, from her false gods and embraced following Yahweh, the one and only true God, committed herself to him and says, no matter what happens, I am following the one true God and committing herself to serving Naomi. How does God respond to that? Will he give her rest and refuge for relying on him? Look at verses seven and eight. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So that when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. What an odd thing to do. A couple things in life I wouldn't recommend buying used. One of them would be shoes. You might get a fungus for free. And yet at this period of time, the custom that accompanied a land transaction was the seller would give his sandals to the buyer, symbolizing the fact that he was removing his right to tread on that land. So no, this closest redeemer is not necessarily selling the land, but he is transferring his right of redemption to Boaz so that he can buy the land. So it's official. Boaz gets him a pair of sandals, a used pair at that, but things much better. Listen to verse nine and 10. Listen to what Boaz declares next. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi, all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Kilion and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead and his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Boaz here gains the right to redeem Ruth. He has the resources to redeem Ruth and he has the resolve to redeem Ruth. And he has done so and by acting in faith also. Boaz is acting in faith that God would provide an heir. Remember, Ruth has been barren in Moab for 10 years. Nothing on the surface looks like having an heir from this marriage is going to be possible. And yet will Yahweh reward her faithfulness? Will he repay her for her faithfulness? You better believe it. You better believe it soonest. In fact, look back at chapter two, verse 12. Not only is God gonna repay her, but he's gonna do it in response to the prayers of his people. If you look at verse 12, Boaz says this, the Lord repay you. This is a prayer by Boaz on behalf of Ruth. The Lord repay you for what you've done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Furthermore, it's God's answer to Naomi's prayer for Boaz that he'd be successful and blessed in chapter two, verse 20, when she says, and Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he, that is Boaz, be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken. So just don't miss this. God is rewarding the faithfulness of Ruth and Boaz. He is rewarding their faithfulness and he is answering the prayers of his people. Speaking of answering prayer, look at the prayers of blessing that we see next in verses 11 and 12. Watch this. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this woman. Watch these three prayers of blessing. One for Ruth, that she would be fruitful It compares her to be fruitful like Rachel and Leah were. What a prayer for fruitfulness. They were the ones who bore the patriarchs of Israel along with their maidservants, if you remember the story. Prayer of blessing for fruitfulness, a a prayer for Boaz that he be famous, that he become renowned and and that he's remembered. And then finally, a prayer for their offspring. 
that he be like the house or the clan of Perez. Perez was the most prominent clan in Judah. And who was Perez? Perez was one of the twins born to the Canaanite woman by the name of Tamar. You remember who Tamar was? A Canaanite woman. Now just think about this. A Canaanite woman who was married to the sons of Judah. Judah was her father-in-law. But after two of them died, Judah refused to give her another one of his sons. So she dressed like a prostitute and deceived her father-in-law into sleeping with her. Perez was born to that. The prayer here, the the picture here, is just as God carried on the line of Judah through Tamarts that made God carry on Judah's line even through this Moabite. You think your family's messed up, students? (laughs) Not this bad. Prayers of fruitfulness for blessing. When we get to the end of chapter 4, verse 12, here's where we are. So far, Boaz has strategically secured the right to redeem Ruth. He has strategically secured the right to redeem Ruth. God has provided rest for Ruth. He's repaid her. He's providing a home for her. But what about Naomi? What about Naomi and what about Boaz? And what about these prayers for blessing, for fruit, and for offspring? What is God going to do now that the ball is solidly in his court? How's God going to respond? Watch verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth. She became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Wow, God, just like that, all of a sudden, in one verse, God works the miraculous. Boaz, as we saw, all of a sudden had gone up to the gates. He was a man on a mission. Now God, all of a sudden, in response to the prayers of his people, gives life where there was barrenness and miraculously provides a son to this union. Not only that, but did you see what Ruth was called here? The wife of Boaz? A woman who was a Moabite former pagan? A foreigner? One who deserved only to be called a slave or a servant? Now elevated to the status of wife of a worthy man in Israel. Also, don't miss the fact here that here we see one of two places in the book of Ruth where God directly intervenes. Did you see that? The Lord gave conception, explicitly stating God's intervention in the lives of these people. Don't be mistaken. God is the one behind every detail in this story. He perfectly timed when the kinsmen came by. He gave Boaz success in the negotiation at the gates, and now he's brought life where there was once death. So as God is, is the one at work in the details of the lives of these ordinary people, God is the one at work in the details of the lives of these ordinary people. Well, at this point, verse 14, Naomi's golden girls show back up on the scene. If you heard Dr. McCarty's sermon, you heard a little bit about them. These women here are the ones who in chapter 1, when Naomi returned from Moab, they kind of looked at her and said, look what the cat drugged in. Man, Naomi, you're not looking so hot. We can't even hardly recognize you. What happened? Notice what they say now. Look at verse 14 through 17. When then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. May his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. And then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Blessed be the Lord, they say, because what they clearly recognize is the hand of almighty supernatural, the supernatural work of almighty God at hand, bringing Ruth rest, giving her a husband, providing her a home, but now working to restore Naomi by the birth of, the birth of a son. They're seeing the hand of God at work. They are remembering what Naomi said when she returned from Moab, but now they're setting the record straight. Naomi had called out against God, called herself bitter, said God had brought this disaster on her. Now they're saying, look what God's done for you. By the way, did you not notice, Naomi, 
this one who loves you that's worth more than seven sons to you? A priceless expression of Ruth's worth to Naomi, even when she was griping and complaining to God, God had put one of the greatest blessings she could ever imagine right under her nose. Students, have you ever been griping and complaining to God all the while while some of his greatest blessings are right under your nose that you fail to see? Worth more than seven sons. Naomi becomes the boy's nanny. The boy's name is Obed, which means provider or guardian. Naomi's emptiness and her grief is turned to fullness and joy. Ruth is given rest in a home. Ten years of barrenness in Moab are reversed with the birth of this boy. Not only has Boaz strategically secured Ruth as his wife, but now God supernaturally supplies a son to redeem and restore Naomi. What a story. What a story. Could you have imagined such an ending? Did you honestly think there was even really a hint, a trace of hope for an old widow named Naomi who had gone off to Moab and lost her family? And for this former pagan named Ruth who's a penniless that's returning with her? Of course you didn't. No way that that could turn around. There's no, no reason to think that there could ever be a good ending to that. And yet, could it have ended any better? So it's, could it get even better? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. I I know what you think. The movie seems like it's ending. The credits are scrolling, but don't get out of your seat from the book of Ruth yet because the hidden scene that's about to come is so epic, you would have never imagined it in your wildest imagination what God's up to here. You would have never seen it coming. Did you see the prayer for Obed in verse 14? Look back down at it. Did you see what they say, what they pray for him? May his name be renowned in Israel. Did God answer that prayer? Look at the end of verse 17. Obed, he was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. David? David? King David? The man after God's own heart? The greatest king in Israel, the one to whom God promised that his throne would last forever, that king David, yes. And yet what did we expect? Did did we think that all these things coming together, these details of this story were just a coincidence? Did we think that the prayers of these people weren't going to the ears of an all-sovereign, gracious God who works in the lives of his people, who longs to meet their needs? God has been at work in the details every step of the way. Students, look at God in this story. Look what he is doing. Look at God and see who he is in every detail that we see unfold here. He has been the one at work all Along And then look at this final few verses, verses 18 through 22. It says, now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amenadab, Amenadab fathered Nashon, and Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, and Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Look at that first line again. Now these are the generations. These are the generations followed by 10 names. Students, here's the beauty of knowing your Bible. That right there is terminology that ought to make you smell something in the kitchen that God is cooking. That ought to remind you of something that God is putting together. Because that terminology is the exact same that's in the book of Genesis where God begins to unfold his plan of redemption for mankind. Genesis chapter 5, the genealogy of Noah, followed by 10 names. And then you get to Genesis 11, the genealogy of Abraham, followed by 10 names there. And then in chapter 12, you get God's promise to Abraham that through him, he's going to bring blessing to every family on the planet through him. Now turn over, hold your place in Ruth, keep that genealogy in mind, turn to Matthew chapter 1 and look at this. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, says this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. He just thought genealogies weren't important. 
the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers and Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron and Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amenadab and Amenadab, the father of Nashon and Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth and Obed, the father of Jesse and Jesse, the father of David, the king. You can't make this stuff up. Hallelujah, look what God is doing. Look what God is putting together. What if Ruth would, Ruth would not have gone to that field of Boaz? Look what God was doing in the details of the lives of ordinary people, orchestrating everything for his plan and his, per, per, and his purpose, ultimately culminating in Jesus Christ. Boaz strategically secured Ruth as his wife. God supernaturally supplied a son to redeem and restore Naomi. And now look at God. God is supernaturally saving his people supernaturally saving his people. God the Father, ultimately in his plan, sent Jesus Christ, the ultimate redeemer, who had the right to redeem us. You know why he had the right to redeem us? Because he took on human flesh, becoming like us, fully God and fully man. He then had the resources to redeem us. Because he lived a perfect, sinless life and died on the cross as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sins, having the resources to redeem us. And you know what? He also had the resolve to redeem us. Because God so loved the world because he so loved you and me, that Christ was willing to go to the cross to redeem us and had that resolved. Students, here's the message of Ruth chapter four. God is directing the details of our ordinary lives in order to accomplish his extraordinary plan. Did you hear me? God is directing the details of your ordinary life in order to accomplish his extraordinary plan. So what does that mean for you and for me? I've got six takeaways I want you to, to hear from the book of Ruth as this applies to you and for me. I'm gonna be quick. You might wanna write these down if you're taking notes. Here's what this means for you and for me. Number one, God is merciful no matter how messed up we are. So we must run to him. He is merciful no matter how much how bad or how messed up we think we are, run to him. It doesn't take a rocket scientist, students, to see that God is using messed up people in this story to accomplish his plan and purpose. Ruth, a Moabite, are you kidding me, God? Rachel and Leah with all their jealousy and deception, Tamar with all her shadiness? I mean, come on, listen, if God, if, if these people couldn't mess up the mercy of God, couldn't thwart his plan, neither can you, neither can I. Now listen, some of you right now think you are beyond God's mercy to use. Some of you right now are entangled in sin that you think you've, has got you too deep, has got too strong of a hold on you for God to ever bring you to a point to use you. And you're absolutely wrong. Amen. You are absolutely wrong. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's an addiction to pornography. I don't care if it's struggling with other sexual desires you know aren't godly or whatever it is, other addiction or situation in your life, you think you're struggling and you realize God's mercy is more powerful than your mess. Will you run to him? God's mercy is more powerful than our mess. Run to him, students. Secondly, God is king and he is in control. God is king and he's in control. We must trust him. When the book of Ruth begins, there's no king in Israel. And even the man whose name means my God is king is dead. If there was ever a time in the book of Ruth, if there were a time in the Bible or scripture, my life or your life, where it looks like God's not king and he's not in control, this is it. This is it. Have you ever felt like that? Ever felt like in your life situations where God's not in control? If he's king, it certainly doesn't seem like it. But did you see what happened when Ruth committed herself without reservation to serving Yahweh? Did you see what happened when Naomi decided to leave the land of Moab and get back to the promised land where God had provided for his people? Did you see what happened? Ruth finds herself by happenstance in Boaz's field. She finds favor in his eyes. God provides her home and a rest and supernaturally supplies a son to not only redeem her, but to redeem Naomi. Is God, is God king and is he in control? You better believe it. Every step of the way. See, students, I realize you will not always see God on the surface of the circumstances of your life. You're not always going to see God on the surface of the circumstances of your life, but stop and look behind the scenes and see the one who's in sovereign control over everything in this universe. 
Look behind the scenes. There you'll see God in sovereign control, watching over you, involved in every detail of your life. God is king. He's in control. You must trust him. Number three, God is kind and he knows your needs. Pray for his provision. He's kind, he knows your needs. Pray for his provision. Kindness is at every turn of this story. Ruth's kindness to Naomi, Naomi's kindness back to Ruth, Boaz's kindness to Ruth and Naomi, all the kindness of the characters pointing to the supreme kindness of the supreme character in the story, and that's God himself, especially as he answers the prayers of his people. As you read this book, you can't help but see the prayers God answers. Boaz's prayer for Ruth, for refuge and reward. Naomi's prayer for Boaz, for blessing and success for him. And then the prayers of the people and the women in chapter four that God answers. Soon as God knows your needs, he desires to meet them. Are you praying in faith for his provision? There's some of you right now that are wondering how you're going to pay off your tuition this semester. Are you praying for God's provision? There's some of you that need a job that's conducive to your school schedule and with your family. Are you praying for God's provision, trusting that he knows your needs, that he will provide? Some of you are looking for a spouse and one has not, or the right one hasn't seemed to come along. Are you praying that God knows the right person for you at the right time? Some of you are about to graduate this semester and don't have a ministry assignment yet. Are you trusting God that he's kind, that he knows your needs, he's got a place for you and he's gonna provide that when you pray for it and trust him? Number four, God is faithful and he rewards faithfulness, so obey him. God is faithful and he rewards faithfulness, so obey him. Despite all the personal pain and setbacks in this book of Ruth, you cannot miss God's faithfulness and the fact that both Boaz and Ruth committed themselves to acting and responding faithfully to God and doing things his way. And as a result, God reverses death and brings life. He overcomes barrenness with birth. Where there's emptiness, he brings fullness. Where there's bitterness, he brings happiness. Where there's despair, he brings hope. As one preacher I've heard say, that I can't put it better, for those who follow the Lord, even in our pain, God's plotting for your good. Even in your pain as a follower of Christ, God is plotting for your good. It wasn't always easy. It's not always gonna be easy for you. Just imagine what was going through Ruth's mind as she was on the edge of that barley field that didn't belong to her, wasn't in a country of her own. She felt like a foreigner wondering, everybody's staring at me, what I'm doing here. She's picking up the scraps from the barley harvest, wondering, God, I've committed myself to you and this is what I get. I'm eking out an existence on the edge of a barley field, picking up the scraps. You ever been there before? Feel like you're somewhere in a land that you don't belong, breaking your back, living on scraps, wondering if rest and refuge is anywhere or ever possible for you? Have you forgotten that God is kind, that he's faithful and that he rewards faithfulness? So just listen to this. God will dig deep in your life before he builds something big. Maybe God's digging deep in your life right now, preparing for something big. Number five, God's weaving your story into his story. God's weaving your story into his story, so find your purpose and identity in him. It's astonishing in this book, the most astonishing thing in the book of Ruth, if you notice, is something that Ruth and Boaz and Naomi never lived to see. The birth of King David. The birth of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. What God's doing in this story was bigger than every character in this story combined. God was weaving their story, little stories, into his big story. And you see, the same thing is exactly true for you and for me. God desires to weave your story into his story, to do something bigger than you or I combined could put together for his name and for his glory. And yet, students, if we're honest with ourselves, don't you and I so often get caught up in building our own story? Don't we get caught up in looking to our success, to our position, for our significance, for our identity and our purpose? As soon as you live that way, we will waste our lives if we live for our own story. And yet God designs to bring your life and your story into his story, to write something greater, to do something greater, to do something more than your life could ever mean by itself for his glory and his name. Find your purpose and identity in him. Finally, number six, God is fulfilling his purpose to bring salvation to the nations, so join him. 
Ruth is a simple story of redemption. It is a tributary, if you will, that runs into the mighty river of God's ultimate and overarching plan to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. God is fulfilling his promise to Abraham that through him all the families of the earth will be blessed because through his line a savior would be born who is Christ the Lord, the Messiah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, the descendant of David. Make no mistake, this genealogy that you see here is a bunch of names. I get it. When you read that, that's what it looks like. But here's what it is in a bigger way. It is God's invitation to you telling you he's using ordinary people to accomplish his extraordinary plan. And this list of names is God's way of inviting you, of beckoning you and me to join him in his story, to be a part of his plan, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. To use ordinary people, to be involved in the details of the lives of ordinary people to accomplish his extraordinary plan. Have you joined? Have you accepted that invitation? Are you giving your life to join him in that story? God is directing the details of our individual lives as ordinary people in order to accomplish his extraordinary plan. Maybe life's bitter for you right now. Maybe you're in a situation where death surrounds you. At least you feel like that. Or you've experienced some type of barrenness. Maybe you feel like you're in the edge of that barley field, picking up scraps. That's what life feels like for you right now. You've committed yourself to serving God, but maybe rest and refuge and purpose and meaning and God doing something in your life feels like the farthest thing that you're experiencing right now. And yet here, the book of Ruth stands in the midst of all life's pain, trials, and setbacks and cries out to us, cries out to us, that God is merciful, that we must run to him. That God is king and he is in control. Will you trust him? That he is kind and he knows our needs. Will we pray and depend on his provision? That he's faithful and he rewards faithfulness. Will you obey him? That he wants to weave your story into his story. Will you find your purpose and significance in him? And finally, that he is saving as he promised to do. Will you join him? You see, students, You and I can trust God in the toughest times of life because as followers of Christ, we know the best times are yet to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice this morning that you, God, have so pursued us in love for us that you have redeemed us, that you, through Christ, are our Redeemer. God, you're doing something with our lives that we could not ever fully imagine for your glory and for your name. God, I know the trials that we experience here now are real, but God, we know that your mercy, your kindness, your faithfulness are far greater. God, we wanna be a group of people that surrender our story to yours, that trust you in the toughest times, knowing that the best of times for the followers of you are yet to come. God, give us that confidence, give us that hope, give us that ability to trust and walk with you faithfully, to keep our eyes on you and to join you in your mission to save. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well, Dr. Walker, thank you for finishing the story, for faithfully walking us through the text and showing us how to apply it to our lives, for reminding us in the big picture that while the story begins at a gravesite in Moab, it ends in a stable in Bethlehem. And so thank you for uh, bringing us through the text and appreciate that. Let me just share with you very quickly a, a few announcements I brought with me. What is the book of the week on behalf of our bookstore in the library. This book is Old Testament Survey, the second edition co-authored by Paul House and our own Dr. Eric Mitchell. And you can find this in uh, the bookstore as well as many other resources that are there in the library and encourage you to go by. If you have not been by and seen the new renovations there, let me encourage you to do that tonight at 7.30 to 9.30 in Reynolds Auditorium, the Southwestern Singers Fall Concert. So I want to encourage you to be, to be there from 7.30 to 9.30, and uh, our Southwestern Singers will be uh, leading that, and we'll look forward to that also tonight at 9 o'clock. Uh, you can participate 
through Facebook, and the uh, ETS panel discussion. The topics will be gender, as well as the topic of the Trinity. And some of those panelists who will be part of that will be Matthew Emerson, Wayne Grudem, Fred Sanders, Bruce Ware, and Malcolm Yarnell. It will be moderated by our own Dr. Patterson and Mark Lanier. That will be tonight at 9 o'clock, and you can follow that live on Facebook. And so I encourage you to do that if you are able. Uh, the rest of the week in chapel, uh, tomorrow, Dr. Justin Buchanan, our own assistant professor of student ministry, will be preaching in chapel. And then on Thursday, Dr. Madison Grace, assistant professor of Baptist history and theology, as well as editor of the Journal of Theology, chair of the church history department, will be speaking on Thursday. And so we're delighted to have all of you here today. And uh, just before we close, Dr. Day is going to lead us in our closing song, and then we'll be dismissed. Amen. Stand with me, please. Every praise is to us.